the next half hour, we're going to speak about the internet. And too often people think that the internet is a global thing. The World Wide Web, right? It must span the whole globe. Well, no, that's not entirely true. Governments in different parts of the world have been trying to shape the internet, having, have been trying to have it their way by either regulating access, content, or even shutting down the internet altogether. Let's start with you, Mrs. Kosterton from ICANN, the technical organization at the back end of the internet. How do you deal with this push by different governments to unravel the internet, to fragment the internet? Thank you, Peter. Yes, it's, it's an excellent question. I think the key thing to understand is, as you say, the internet is not just what you see. That is the content. But the content is provided by a, a single interoperable a foundation, a technical infrastructure, like the foundation of your house. You can't see it, but it keeps your house standing. And the, that technical foundation, which is part of ICANN's remit on the domain name system, coordinating the technical identifiers that, that keep it working, keep it functioning for 30 years, has never gone down, but also the servers, the cables, the satellites, all the infrastructure that actually makes the internet function. That is underneath the house of content, if you like. And what governments typically see is the content. And they want to regulate the content sometimes because they don't like it, and they want to protect their citizens. And we don't expect governments, it's not up to ICANN, to say to governments, you can't regulate. But what we need to make sure is that when those governments do that, they know the technical consequences of that regulation because the internet does not recognize country borders. It is a global network of networks, and if you start to mess with that foundation, because you do it by accident, you take away the security of the foundation. You chip and you crack, and we all know what happens if you get too many cracks in the foundation of your house. Your house falls down, yeah. and then you have no house. And so the content, the taking it for granted that it will always be there, you can't do that, but that's an a that's a unintended consequence. And I can spend a lot of time educating governments, plan, think about it before you yeah. do that. We will help you. The other side is intentionally politicizing content, the, the internet to try and take away the role of other stakeholders and hand it entirely over to governments. Yeah. So different things, but they're both risks. They're both fragmentation risks. Yeah. So we learned that the foundation is maybe a bit under attack. It's threatens to become unstable. Uh, Gabenga, if I turn to you, you, your paradigm initiative, you told me you were based in Lagos, Nigeria, Africa, where a lot of people still have to be connected to the internet. It seems that you're actually like entering a house that is increasingly unstable. How do you deal with that? So we, one of the things that many of us take for granted is that everyone is connected, right? Uh, we assume that everyone is connected, uh, you know, businesses, create products uh, that require you to have reliable, consistent internet access. Uh, we're talking about you know, uh, AI and all of the various things. But the assumption is not correct. There are at least over 2 billion people who don't have access to the internet, not because they don't want to, but because of reasons like investment, infrastructure, they don't have access to the internet. But beyond that, there's also a category of people who used to have internet access, but for some reason, their governments, because they don't want them to get access to certain services, cut them off. So you have the people who are connected, you have those who are not connected, but you also have those who are disconnected. And that is a major problem. Unfortunately, one of the lessons that we learned during COVID is that when you look at young people who are learning, uh, people who are going to work, it was impossible to do that offline uh, while they were locked down. So the kids who didn't have access to the internet were not learning. Not only were they not learning, they were losing the new lessons that their colleagues were learning. And right now, that means that either they are unconnected or disconnected, we now are creating a digital divide that is getting wider. There are people who have assumed access, reliable access, but there are those who don't have internet access, either because they're not connected or because they're disconnected. And one of the bigger challenges we have is that there are governments who are used to controlling everything, controlling the news, controlling information you get 
and are now, I've now seen the internet as a place that, you know, uh, dissidents and even any young person can say what they want, and so they shut down, either shutting down the internet or shutting down services on the internet, and that is a problem. That's why when we have conversations about fragmentation, one of the things we also want to talk about is the fact that everyone can't just take it for granted that everyone you want to communicate with will always be mm. offline, yeah. will always be online. Some will be offline, either because they're not connected or because they're deliberately disconnected. Yeah. If we speak about the, this group of disconnected people who once had internet, now, now not anymore, it feels like that's an example of where the internet has been indeed politicized, as you mentioned. Um, how do you push for this digital right, the right to be connected as from maybe a technical or a non-profit a foundational uh, perspective, how do you fight for this um, in the front of politicians who want to control? What's the playbook? Well, it's a, it's a good question. So that there is um, there, a part of, I think I'm right in saying, and I'm not an expert on this, but increasingly the internet is seen by many as a human right, internet access. You would know this better than me. But this is an increasingly a, a, a narrative that um, society is, is, is demanding, is expecting. And I think we can, for many of the reasons you say, Gamanga, I mean, you can understand absolutely why. Because being connected to the internet, especially, for example, during COVID, you're connected to the world or not, depending on, on what position you're in. So I understand the drive for that. And I understand why governments want that. And so from ICANN's perspective, the goal is to maintain the stability and the impotent operability of the technical layer. Because without that, anything you want to do with content is at risk. Yeah. So can you, if detail, can want you detail that, that a bit, maybe? Because yes. interoperability I, is a difficult I can, word. I can what is like, how do you, how do you I'll explain. explain so that? We coordinate the identifiers of the domain name system. That's the web addresses, as well as the numbers and the rules, the protocols that dr dr drive the traffic around the network of networks that is the internet. So if you dial, if you're sitting here in Lisbon, and you type into your browser, I don't know, let's say websummit.com, OK? And I'm sitting in New Delhi, and I type into my browser, New Demi, New Delhi, uh, bleh, web summit.com, we see exactly the same site, because there is only one registered website in the IANA system that we oversee that is for, that, for this, for Web Summit. We know who they are, and they're registered. Now, if you splinter the internet, if you fragment the internet, you lose the ability to have singu that singular focus. So the experience that we have of the internet today will change. And eventually, you fragment into what some people call digital islands. And of course, people want, when most governments want, when they say we want people to have internet access, what they mean is access to everything, the way we have today. Yeah. So it's a, it's a misalignment. You, know, you have to make sure you keep the technical infrastructure safe so that you can continue to deliver on that promise, if you're a government. Yeah. Benga, do you think that in Africa, um, where a lot of the digital infrastructure still needs to be built up, um, that there is a bigger risk to become a digital island because the control over that infrastructure can already be imposed, while in other uh, regions that's maybe um, more established already, that the internet is open and free for everyone? Is that a risk? There's a risk, there's a risk for that. Uh, and, and what you have is sort of an irony. Uh, you have a lot of governments saying, we want to be connected to the world because the world is, the world as a market is an economic opportunity. But at the same time, you have governments who want to control the narratives. And don't forget, the world is a lot more divided now than when the internet was being designed. Um, and unfortunately, what you then have is a sort of scenario where governments want to control not just content, but also the flow of data. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have governments now saying that any data you process for our citizens should be processed physically here. In many cases, it's not just for the economic reasons. It's also to be able to have access. Don't forget, there are many governments who have said to big tech, uh, we want you to take this content down because we don't like it. And big tech has been able to find a way to say, you know what, this content is global. We can't just take it down for you. In some cases, they do that. So a lot more governments want to control what people see. A lot more governments also want to be able to say, listen, uh, if you're going to operate and use data for our citizens, we want that 
data domiciled in this country. And that's a big challenge. One of the reasons why we started you know, studying the trend from 2016 and the film, the, you know, the, the reel you saw earlier, uh, those are three different films that we made from the report we've done since 2016 to date. Uh, the fourth film is actually in production now and will be ready for the uh, International Human Rights Day on, on December 10. And what we're doing with the films is to tell the story of what happens. A very simple example, we predicted in the last film we did that Senegal will shut down the internet. And we all sort of laughed about it because we were like, will Senegal really shut it down? But we've seen what has happened over the last few years. There's the politics of it, there's the technology of it, there's the business of it, and there is, unfortunately, as we see in politics in many African countries, the big man, literally, side of things, where somebody mm -hmm. wants political office, and because they want political office, they will do anything, including yeah. shutting down the internet. So when the internet was shut down earlier this year, we were not surprised mm -hmm. because we've yeah. been looking at this trend for a long time. But the real challenge now is that you now have a lot more citizens who are connected, who are using that connection yeah. that governments are promoting so that they can get you know, more income to then question the same government. Yes. Yeah. Let's go into some of the internet shutdowns, blackouts that we had last year. Internet played a big role in geopolitical events, both in Ukraine as recently in Gaza. For example, in Ukraine, we've seen that the internet was taken down or went in a blackout at a certain moment. Starlink stepped in, um, now also in Gaza. As a technical organization, do you want to drag in into those kind of conflicts um, that can actually have a big importance on the ground? Yeah, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really important question, Peter. Um, well, I can tell you, in, in the case of Ukraine and Russia, that's exactly what happened. So, I mean, it's very well known, uh, maybe not to everybody here, but um, when the conflict broke out, the Ukrainian, the, the part of the Ukrainian government that runs the country code, we call it the CCTLD, the country code top level domain, um, said for Ukraine, came to ICANN, and they have a group in ICANN of all the country code uh, top level domains inside ICANN. They said, ICANN, we want you to take .ru, the Russian country code, off the internet, now. Is that possible? Can you do no. it? No. <laughs> First thing is, no. I mean, I, I don't know whether you really get, but it, it showed a, a major misunderstanding about how this actually works, because this is this consensus-based, multi-stakeholder policy over decades that puts together the rules around how CCs are allocated. So it's not a plug in the wall in Los Angeles called .ru that you just go buy, you know, we don't want the Russians anymore. So. That, just to be clear, no, is the short answer. But m much more importantly than that, when ICANN was created, and when it was, when it was tra the transition from the oversight of the US government happened in 2016, which was a very important point for the global stakeholders to run these critical infrastructure identifiers, in the bylaws, it tells me as the CEO, ICANN, you must not be a political organization, ever. You cannot, you are neutral, and you must never take sides so these are very tight, firm guardrails. So we couldn't say to the Ukrainians, well, yes, you know what, this week, maybe we'll agree with you. Next week, we don't know. We also can't be told to do that by another government, not the US government, not any other government. And just because people, there is this misconception. The final thing I would say about it is, if for some reason, which is you could do it, and we were allowed to do it, neither of which is true, had we done it, we would have been fragmenting the internet infrastructure ourselves which is obviously not what we want to do. So all those reasons, but, but I don't want to underestimate how politicized this issue is. Those top level country code domains sometimes have millions of domains under management in their countries. They are critical infrastructure in most countries. But so I get that, it, I get it, why they think it's important. Isn't that a fundamental threat also to your organization? Because you could reason that when this item is so politicized, Politicians maybe will think like, well, if I want to take down or attack the critical infrastructure that domain names that the internet is, then let's go for the, the role of I can well, CEO. That, <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's much more serious than that. Um, the, yes, the risk, there is a risk that the internet infrastructure community, the coordination that makes it work, will be threatened by political means. And this is the threat which may happen in a couple of years' time at the at the, the World Summit of Information Society in, in, in inside the UN processes, they will review the, the settlement 
in 20, 20 years ago that created this multi-stakeholder governance model that has been so successful in giving us the internet we have today. Because by the way, that's why we have it. I mean, all that great content, all that innovation did not come out of nowhere. It was the ability to deliver it safely and through sustainable policies that made it possible. But yes, you're right. There are some state actors, there are some governments, not many, but some, who don't like that for exactly the reasons you say. And they may seek to try and change that in these fora like, like, the, like the WSIS Plus 20 review. This is not the UN saying we don't like this. This is just the forum where the governments come together and they vote, mm. which is the UN. And they would, some of them, like the, all those other stakeholders, all the people, all the 5.6 yeah. billion internet users to go away and the only people that make decisions are the governments. But isn't there because like governments, especially at the, at the multilateral forum now, they like to talk about AI, it's the regulating AI, it's the new shiny, shiny topic, but actually they should speak about internet governance, but that's maybe not that sexy. Well, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that it's, this is a very important issue this week. It's come up in most of the panels we've been on, most of the meetings we've had. And I think what happens when you see AI come into the mainstream, as it appears to have done much more than, I mean, it's been around for a long time, mm -hmm. but we all know this is a very recent phenomenon. And it's the same a little bit like content for the governments. They look at it and they go, whoa, this is going to be scary for our people. We have to do something about it. And what that means is that the question of regulation and governance of the internet is more on the subject topic of governments. And there is more of a risk that they pull that handle on regulation. And that's the unintended consequence. Because it's not that they shouldn't react. It's up to them. It's not up to us. But if they harm the internet's infrastructure and its technical functioning by mistake, it could be triggered by AI, I agree with you. And, and, and the, yeah. the fear or the anxiety that we have to control it and that maybe we control it at a country level because it makes us feel better that we can do something for our citizens. But, but it, unfortunately, the internet doesn't work like that. So yeah. we have to be really on the front foot and very proactive about continually educating them. To say, be careful, be careful. Benga, we already... Uh, mentioned a lot that the internet is, and especially the internet infrastructure, is critical infrastructure. But I can imagine in, in Africa that a lot of people are still battling for access to water or to food or to other or to even electricity. Um, what is your assessment there? Is digital, where is digital or the access to internet, digital infrastructure, where is that position towards the other basic needs? It, the internet is basic, um, and I think that was proved in 2020. Uh, even if you had water, you had food, and you had everything, and you were not connected, you couldn't go to work, you couldn't earn money uh, to buy the water or to pay for the water. Uh, so one of, one of the critical things we've learned over the last few years, particularly when the, literally the entire world shut down, is that digital opportunities are not a nice to have. Yeah. They're literally the drivers of the world that we live in. Uh, in you know, getting access to water, in paying for it, in processing it, now you have to use digital channels. And I, I, I also wanted to touch on the, you know, the multi-stakeholder processor you know, uh, that you, know, you mentioned. And the reason for that is because the, one, of the, one of the development goals that we talked about and agreed when the entire world met in 2003 uh, for the World Summit on Information Society was an agreement to talk about the internet as multi-stakeholders, not just as government, uh, as civil society where I belong, as you know, private sector, as a technical community where ICANN is, as government, and as we now have these conversations, um, you know, as as you said, in as Sally said, in, in in two years we're going to have this, you know, WISIS was in 2005. We're going to have WISIS plus 20, where governments will come together, and I think it's important for everyone, not just people who are involved on a daily basis, but everyone who do business online and who do who are literally interested in using the internet to also follow this process and make sure that governments alone don't make that decision, that we all contribute to making that decision. Because at the end of the day, what the internet will look like in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, should not be a decision that governments alone will make. One of the outcomes of the WISIS process... <laughs> No, I was just completely agreeing yeah. with you. And, and, and I That's couldn't just say That's not good in a debate when everyone's... I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, 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 you're not supposed to have us agree with each other. But, but no, I mean, you're totally right. And what I would say to, to, to everybody here, if you're here pitching for business and looking for partners, you probably assume that the internet is always going to be the way it is yep. today. And what we're telling you is it may not be. Yep. Don't take it for granted. And, and you're making an excellent point that the criticality of it now 
is both a tremendous opportunity. Look what we've done in the last 30 years. I mean, who could have imagined where we would be 30 years ago? But that we can't assume the next 30 years will be like that. On the other hand, everyone in this room can do something about that, which is what you're saying. You know, you can talk to your government representatives. You can get involved in the Internet Society and ICANN in the Internet Governance Forum. And these are all open to everybody, multiple languages, lots of online content, and do have your voice heard. So, you know, and for, with the risks will grow because of the things you're talking about. They're not going to get less, they're going to increase. Will the risks also grow for physical infrastructure? Because you mentioned yes. earlier, like, governments want increasingly, like, the data stored on their own, yes. on their own soil in, in data centers. Europe, as well, has been driving this push to data localization. Is there a risk that there is also this, this control over physical infrastructure? Well, potentially. I mean, I think this is back to sort of regulatory issues and you know, how governments or groups of governments like in the EU decide that they want to implement policy, which is what you're talking about here. Um, we have enormous, we have frequent ongoing dialogue with the EU, with the member states, um, with all global governments. We have 180, at least more than 180 global governments inside ICANN in the Government Advisory Committee, including the ITU have a seat there, for example, our, our technical partners, as well as, um, as the EU. It has its, its own seat in the GAC. And we must connect and understand and share the, under, the consequence discussion. And it's it, everybody, you know, this is, the multi-stakeholder process is about people who don't agree with each other. Yeah. But are you, are you speaking enough? You're speaking to governments, but are you speaking enough to citizens? I, we, well, this is why we're at the Web Summit. <laughs> Seriously, Definitely. Peter, it's ICANN's first visit to the Web Summit, and this is why we're here. Because we, I agree with you, we do need, I mean, ICANN is a technical organization, but we all have a stake. We are literally the stakeholders in how the internet is for the next 10, 20 years, exactly as you say. So I think, yes, we owe it to everybody here to say, don't take it for granted, but do be aware that you can do something about it. So I don't want to frighten people. I think I want to empower them, but I also don't want people to be complacent. And yes, I do think we need to talk more to okay. people, particularly these kinds of guys at this summit who are looking to make their businesses on the internet. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we can't assume the internet will continue to exist. I think that's Just for doing you know, nothing, we all have to get involved. And there are so many opportunities, internet governance forum opportunities, uh, and even just to follow the UN ongoing process uh, and yeah. to make sure that we make our voices heard. We want the internet to work for us and to empower us. Regrettably, we have to wrap up. I think the main takeaway here was like, when you click open the internet on your smartphone later, don't take it for granted. Uh, don't take it for granted that it will exist for years. And if you want to become the boss of the inter internet, apply for uh, your, your job as the CEO of ICANN. <laughs> so thanks for the panelists. Thanks for speaking up. And, Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.